thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here. I was a professor here, as some of you know, from 94 to 2000. <laughs> and actually, much of my research agenda that I've been doing since then was, was formulated and started while I was a professor at UCLA. So I've had a really nice time walking around and seeing the campus. And it's allowed me some time to reflect on, on where my project has been and where it's going. And uh, you'll be, it's, it's really nice for me to be able to give you a current view of the research as it stands today. All right, I work on the old one. And I don't just study the artifacts and try to figure out you know, how to describe them. I'm actually interested in what the behavioral significance of the old one is. What is the old one? The old one is the oldest lithic technology. So far, its, its stone tools go back to about 2.6 million years ago. And you know, we don't even know exactly which hominids, probably more than one hominid, may be making these sites. But you've got, you've got at these old one sites, sometimes low density scatters, sometimes high density scatters of stones. And right, the old ones represented by stones that have had sharp flakes detached for them, so cores, you know, colloquially. And, and these sharp shards of rock, which are essentially external teeth, right? Things you can use for cutting and processing things called flakes. And cores and flakes in the old one are produced in a variety of ways, often through something called hard hammer percussion, where you use one rock to knock flakes off of another rock. Hammer an anvil, where you put up a core on an anvil and you'll strike it from above and maybe knock flakes off from both sides, or just simply an anvil technique as well. So there are multiple ways of knocking flakes off, but it looks like the desired the desired entity is, is, in fact, the flake. And then the, the, the bigger tools can be used for heavy-duty tasks as well. Now, there are a lot of interesting things about the old one. It's a, this really interesting transitional time period. You've got increasing diversity in the hominid fossil record between two and three million years ago when the old one is showing up. You've got Paranthropus show, evolving. You've got earliest Homo evolving. And you know, it may be you've got environmental change in East Africa, which may be partly what, what all of this evolutionary change is related to. You actually are having evolutionary responses by different hominid lineages to the environmental change that's occurring. So the old one's really interesting, I think, for a number of reasons. It's the oldest evidence of technology. It may, in fact, reflect a major ad adaptive shift. That's something that's being investigated. It may reflect dietary change and also a change in the way individual individuals within hominid groups are interacting with each other. It also shows that hominids are restructuring their activities across the environment because they're forming archaeological sites. And they're moving resources across the landscape, which is really one of the key adaptations of the old one. It's resource movement around the landscape. These resources are clearly rocks, which we have evidence for, as well as foodstuffs. And, and, and the evidence that we have in terms of food are animal carcass parts. So it's clear that they're transporting carcasses across the landscape, as well as lithics, stone, across the landscape. And as I said, this is broadly associated with environmental change and the turnover, in hom and turnover of different hominid taxa. And in terms of thinking about this in the landscape, you know, when you go out and study non-human primates today, they're generally feeding as they go. They're not, they're not doing, most pr non-human primates do not do a lot of resource transport. So if you saw, I would imagine, Australopithecines moving across the landscape as well, they would probably be feeding as they went, just like most non-human primates do today. With the old one, you actually have sites being formed. So you may have foraging across the landscape, but, but some of the, the, the food, and as well as the lithics, are being transported and deposited in what I think often are just kind of garbage, you know, garbage sprees across the landscape. And we recognize these as archaeological sites. All right, so what the archaeological sites represent in the end are residues of hominid behavior. So understanding the, what's going on at the sites, but also how the sites fit into landscape scale patternings of behavior are, are really interesting questions that, that you know, my research is trying to address. All right, and I. My research follows an experimental approach, and I'll be talking about work that's done in, in my group, which includes work by graduate students as well as work that I've done myself. And basically, when you're dealing with two million year old sites, you can't, you can't actually observe the past. You can't, you're dealing with species that, that are not existing today. So, really, you know, 
a lot of what we're doing is based on uniformitarianism. We have to use experimental frameworks to provide some sort of context to the archaeological and paleontological materials. And that means looking at living animals today, looking at the behavior of non-human primates and carnivores, using, you know, doing, making experiments, doing experiments with replicas of the stone tools to see what you can actually do with these things that you're studying, and looking for analytical techniques that better integrate different classes of data. Um, also, what's really important is hypothesis testing and what I call natural history experiments, where we can't control the context or the resources that were available to hominids in the past. But if you do controlled comparisons between different sites where hominids had access to different resources, you can actually tease out behaviors, interesting behaviors from that, from doing these comparisons between hominid behavior at different sites where hominids had accesses to different kinds of resources. So I, I call those kind of natural history experiments, because I, I actually can't lay out the things and, and the hominids then play with them. I'm looking at what the hominids did with the things that were laid out at that time. All right, old one sites start off in East Africa. The oldest sites are 2.6 million years old. They're, they're often not very extensive. They're often not that many stone tools. Starting after about, well, at around 2 million years ago, old ones, you start getting some very large accumulations of bones and artifacts. Um, and you start getting old one sites found in regions other than East Africa, all right? So at, after two million years ago, you get them in, in South Africa and North Africa. And, uh, you know, Demonisi, the homo, early Homo erectus in Georgia, is essentially using the old one technology. And the earliest sites in China between 1.6 and 1.7, that's essentially old one technology as well. So after two million years ago, you seem to have a spread. I don't know if it's a sampling error or what, but you seem to, you know, as the, the, the data stands now, you've got a spread from East Africa to other parts of the world. And, you know, obviously this is associated, Demonisi is associated with Homo erectus moving out of Africa. Uh, the site where I'm working, or the region where I'm working, is the Hama Peninsula, which is number 10 here. I'll often refer to a, a site called FLK Zinj at Olduvai Gorge, um, which is sort of the exemplar of the Old One in terms of Old One Hama behavior and has been for a long time. So that's number 11 there. So here's FLK Zinj versus one of, the, one of my biggest excavation at Kanjara South, which is excavation one. All right, they both have hominid collected fauna. They're both in a lake margin. They both provide some proxies for paleo-environmental structure, like pedogenic carbonates, so habitat. You can do reconstructions of, of the distribution of different plants across the landscape, plants, plant, uh, distributions. Zinge is about 1.8 million years old. It, it was a very large site, but the Zinge level is, is down, down low here and it had lots of stone tools and artifacts. It was only about nine, cent nine centimeters thick, so it was not, it's representing a relatively short window of time as these sites go. 700 bones to family or below, so you can tell whether it's a bobid, you know, an antelope or a pig or something like that, at least to that level of identification at least 47 different individual animals. So a minimum number of individuals of 47. So, you know, in this spot, which as you can see is not that big, are the remains of 47 animals across that, that nine centimeter horizon and 2,600 artifacts. The setting at Kanjara, the overall geographic setting is somewhat similar, but the actual site itself is quite different. It's, it's a little bit older. Um, and we have materials distributed through, through a three meter sequence. So you actually have, you know, layer after layer after layer in this three meter sequence of material. So hominids are going back repeatedly to this spot, you know, over and over and over again. It's a, it's, it's a really, it's something's attracting them to this place and they're going back there over and over, over decades to, to centuries, all right? So it's, it's a longer time interval than what you have represented at Zinge when you look at it cumulatively. We have 1,500, bones to family or below, and MNI is larger of 81, and, and unlike Zinge, where, where wildebeest-sized or zebra-sized animals are most common, at Kanjara, goat-sized animals, smaller antelopes are most common. And we've got a large sample of artifacts as well. All right, and here's the Hama Peninsula, jutting out into the Wynnum Gulf of Lake Victoria, and you've got an extinct volcano with sediments draped around it. And, you know, there are actually more than one Oldham on site. We've, in recent years, found other sites around that side. 
here, here's where Kanjar is. I'll talk about these other sites briefly at the end. So Kanjar is there in the north, and uh, it's on the slopes of an extinct volcano. This is what it looks like when you're walking to the amphitheater. There's about 15 <coughs> meters of sediment, and it's the base of the sequence where the archaeological occurrences are found. All right, so just looking at the stratigraphy, right, so you're looking at, you know, a, a big chunk of the, the, the three or so meters that I'm talking about. It's a little bleached out here, but there are three primary beds we're talking about. <coughs> the top of bed KS1, bed KS2, and bed KS3 are the, are the units that have the archaeological materials. And basically, in terms of the depositional history of the site, the site starts off with something called remobilized pyroclastic sediments. And that's uh, a very fancy way of saying the hominids had a very bad day, where you had basically a lahar going over the site and, and wiping everything out. So any hominid that was standing there would be under, you know, 20 feet of sediment, and we'd never find it. All right, so that's actually the beginning of the sequence at Kanjara, and it just sort of wipes the slate clean. And then what happens after that is you have fluvial reworking. You've got, you've got water washing down from the foothills of Humma Mountain, going towards a lake that's north of the site. And, and it's not really rapid streams. It's little braided stream systems and sheet wash. And that's what's depositing the sediments that are burying the, the materials, the archaeological materials. So fluvial reworking of the parent materials going on through the top of KS1 through KS2. And then the lake starts expanding. And it gets, starts getting a little swampy at Kanjara. And then ultimately, the lake covers the site. All right, so here I'm going to show the, the fluvial reworking of that parent lahar material. So here's one of these little rivulets. When I, you know, water is coming over the site, but often it's, 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 it's not flowing that fast. So you're, it's depositing silts or fine sands. Here's, I, I just sprayed water on a rivulet so you could see one of these little channels. It's less than a meter th wide, and, and it's only, you know, a few centimeters, like 10, 20 centimeters deep. And on either side of it are, are silts which also preserve fossils and artifacts. So the material may have been moved a little bit by water action, but it's not been moved a lot. Um, and, and it's hominids. It's, it's not water that's depositing the artifacts and fossils. It's hominid, hominid activities that are depositing these materials. All right, so you've got the base level rise, and you've got the leg transgression, and the whole thing's covered with water, and, and the archaeological sequence is over. Um, when I'm working in the field and we've got the excavations going in full swing, we hire 50, you know, at least 50 people. So I, I, I hire lots of local people. I hire trained excavators from the National Museums of Kenya. I work with colleagues from the National Museums of Kenya from various institutions in the U.S. and England and Italy. So it's a big, uh, big team, all right? And, and you know, one, actually my first graduate student anywhere, Joe Ferraro was actually in this photo, and he got his PhD from, from UCLA. All right, so it's a big project. It requires a lot of, you know, standing around and scratching your head and making sure people are doing the right thing at the right time. So stuff that I'm not so good at, but I do my best. And we excavate following the normal procedures, where you do one, cent one meter squares, five centimeter spits, everything's shot in with the total station. So we try to record things as, as carefully as we can. Each, each square has got its own designation that's put on the bag. And as I said before, Kanjara, you know, got this, this excavation got to be a fairly big excavation. And this is what you get when you're hitting a nice layer. The, the red and dark bits are, are, are stone tools, and all these white bits are, are bones. All right? So you get scatters of stone tools and bones at different spots through this sequence. There's the Queen Mary for scale. And we've got uh, an antelope mandible and a part of an antelope hip joint. You've got a zebra tooth. You've got a flake. And you can see you actually have bones from different animals in close proximity. They're not laid out in skeletons. They've been separated and pulled apart, and they've been butchered, and you just have them sort of laying out on, on the site. And, you know, when you're done at the end of the season, you, you backfill it to preserve it. So here we are in the process of backfilling it. And, you know, I, I had big excavations going on through 2001. I had another season of excavation in 2009. And it, everything is now backfilled. And I'm about to go back this summer and start another four years of excavation. Lots of bones. And like I said, you know, what we get from the finds are stone tools and bones. And 
a lot of the bones are from relatively small antelopes, which is unusual for the old one. Often you get lots of larger animals represented, but here at Kanjara we've got a lot of reasonably small animals. You do get some big things though. So, that, so in one level there is a partial hippo skeleton. There are bits and pieces of elephant that are just elephant teeth. You know, here's a hippo tooth. There are some carnivores, so it's not just the hominids are traipsing across the landscape worry-free. You know, we have saber-toothed cats from the peninsula. There are lions, lion fossils from the site, big field fossils from the site. There are hyena. These hyena bones are from the excavation, so there are hyenas around. Um, here's a felid proximal ulna. So you have the hominids, but it's clear the hominids are, inter, you know, are, are having to deal with or, or have to take into consideration the big cats and, and hyenas that are around at the same time. I have much better fossils of baboons at other sites, but this is one of my few monkey fossils from the site. Just I thought I'd throw a primate in. All right. I've got a few bird bones as well, so here's a guinea fowl fossil and, and, and the odd reptile as well. Here are a few croc fossils. The artifacts and fossils are in primary context. They're outsized class. The bones are represented by a range of hydraulic potentials, so bones that, are, that differ in their ease of transport by water. Very little evidence of sedimentary abrasion. The bones are buried very quickly, so they have very low weathering stages. There are some fossil and artifact refits, not, not as much as some other sites where there are lots of refits, but, but some refits. And you know what it represents is repeated utilization of this point in the landscape over decades to centuries. So these sorts of assemblages are not common. I'm really lucky that I've had access to this kind of setting. This is, in fact, the oldest big assemblage for the old one at 2 million. Even though the sites go back further in time, most of them don't have fauna, or the fauna is very scrappy. So it's nice that I've got both the faunal evidence as well as the lithic evidence, and I'm going to talk about both. And you can ask some questions about early homo. I think it's early homo forming these sites. I can, we can talk about why that is later if you want, but I'm just going to launch into it. And when you're talking about this time period from two to three million years ago, where a lot seems to be going on and landscapes seem to be remodeled periodically, you can ask, you know, what sort of, what range of habitats were available to the hominids and, and what, hom what habitats are they actually using? So these are all, I'm going to ask a series of questions that I'm going to try to answer or, or show where the data from Kanjara actually provided some interesting information about it. So this is the first issue. It's just about the environmental context and where the hominids are on these landscapes. And in Africa today, obviously, you have a whole spectrum of environments, you know, a continuous spectrum from forest to grassland, right, with, with forms of woodland in between. Prior to two million years ago, from three million years ago and older, many of the sites are, are many hominid sites are, are well wooded. And it looks like the Australopithecines, even when they're in mixed habitats that include grasslands, there are always woodlands around Australopithecine sites. All right, so, so Australopithecines seem, you know, are, are definitely spending time in and around wooded areas. One of the things that we were struck by when we started excavating at Kanjara, just by looking at the surface fossils, you can tell a lot just by looking at the surface, was that almost everything we picked up was from an open habitat, which was, you know, unlike any older one site from, from that time period or, or a little bit older. Right, so we had, I just, we were looking, laying at the teeth out, and almost everything was something that today would be living in, in grasslands. So 93% of the antelopes, for example, that we found, and, and this is true in situ as well, this is the in situ number actually, were from open grasslands. And zebra fossils were very common. They made up a little bit more than 10% of the assemblage. And that, that is very different than Old Dubai, for example, where, where the open country habitats are not as common and where pigs way outnumber zebras by and large in bed one. So there was, I could see from the beginning that there was some sort of faunal difference from other sites. And you know that held true from doing the analysis of the fauna of the in situ material, the thousands of bones. But there are also you know, geo geochemical ways of trying to get at the, uh, the vegetation structure as well. One of them is looking at the stable carbon isotopic composition of paleosol carbonates, these little nodules that form in the soil. All right, and they give you a sense of what the photosynthetic pathway was of the vegetation that was growing across the landscape at that time. And you can use that, use that to reconstruct vegetation structure. So if you look at, this is from a PLOS One article in 2009, if you look at you know, East African environments that are represented by isotopic sampling going back to 10 million years ago, and you look at the sort of spectrum of habitats that are represented, 
at these different Miocene and Pliocene and Pleistocene sites through time. You know, what you've got is a really strong woodland signal through, through much of the time period of, of early hominid evolution. And this first spike to the right, which is where you've got woody grassland and open grassland, is in fact Kanjara. So the Paleosaur carbonate data actually matched what we were seeing from the, the, the taxonomy of the fauna, a very open signal for, for the, the setting where the archaeological site was being formed. Almost every other old one site seems to have been formed in a more wooded setting. All right, so, and this is in fact the oldest, I think, the oldest really strong open signal for the whole time period of human evolution. I mean, this is the first time where you really have a good open setting represented. And you can also look at what the animals are eating through the same way, through using stable isotopic chemistry of their enamel. And if you look at, you know, what things are eating at Kenjara, almost everything is eating a substantial amount of C4 vegetation, of, of, of vegetation that's growing in more open habitats like grass and some forbs in some sedges. All right, so you've got, you've got a very strong C4 signal here across many, many different animals. And the only thing that's browsing were, you know, bits of a Dinotherium tooth, which is this crazy elephant that's got, elephant relative, that's got tusks coming from its lower jaws instead of its upper jaws, like the modern elephant. And it is an obligate browser. And these are actually the most, most grassy signals for the diet of this taxon ever found. So even this guy probably wasn't very happy and was eating grass a little bit of the time. All right, so it's clear that this site from multiple proxies is forming in an open environment. And, you know, I'm sure if you turned, if the hominids turned around and looked at the mountain behind them, there would have been trees up the mountain. So it's not like there are no woodlands around. But the plains around the lake were probably very grassy with, you know, occasional trees spotted across them. So it's an open setting. It's a very open setting, more than 75% grass. And hominids are going back to this open setting over and over and over again for, for probably hundreds of years. So this, this is a different sort of behavior than you see prior to this. And in fact, when you look at earlier Oldemans or other Oldeman sites like Zinge, which are forming in woodlands, this sort of extends our range not only of what habitats that exist, but also where hominids are being active. It shows that hominids are not just living, you know, are not just active in the woodlands. They're, they're moving into more open habitats as well and, and getting resources and, and depositing artifacts in those open settings too. So when we look at this questions, you know, one of the first questions we sort of addressed was what sort of, what range of habitats are being used? And it seems for the old one, by two million years ago at least, but, and, and I'm going to always qualify because I'm talking about two million years ago where Kanjara, that's when Kanjara is around. By about two million years ago, it looks like you've got a range of habitats being utilized by older one hominids. They're, they're dumping stone tools. They're moving lithics around the landscape. They're making stone tools. What, what is their energetic investment in lithic technology? Is this something they're just doing seasonally? Are they just having a need for a tool and picking whatever is up around their feet and utilizing it? <coughs> which would be sort of an incidental use of stone tool technology, or is stone tool technology, you know, an integral part of their foraging behavior? Is it, is it really key to their adaptive success? And these are sort of issues you can address looking at the technologies that are around. So one of the things we've been looking at is raw material selectivity, preferential transport, and, and, and how different raw materials are reduced, how they're flaked, how extensively they're flaked, how carefully they're flaked. So these things give you a sense, you know, you can actually get some, some sense of how sophisticated hominid usage and treatment of different physical materials in their, in their environments are, right, when you're looking at these things. So you can look at raw material availability, you can also look at raw material quality, and you can see what sort of technological decisions their hominids are, are, are doing. And, you know, decision making that not only goes into procurement and manufacture, but also is going into discard. And ultimately this is to get at this idea of what is the adaptive significance of the older one, at least at Kanjara, right? I'm going to always focus on that. Is it something that, that is really adaptively significant, or is it something that's sort of incidental and maybe seasonally or just more, more casually used in foraging or, or food preparation? Well, as part of this, a student named David Braun, who is now a professor at George Washington University, you know, he, he did a very wide survey of all the potential lithic sources for the stone tools uh, on the Humba Peninsula, so here's Kanjara, but also in the region. And it turns out it had to be regional because some of the raw materials that are found at Kanjara are ultimately coming from highlands 50 or 60 kilometers away. And they're coming down drainages 
and, and ending up about 13 or more kilometers away from the site. And once this was done and samples were taken of these different rocks, you could actually look at the rocks and start thinking about the material properties. And the first thing to look at or think about at Kanjara, one of the first things that was striking about the lithic assemblage is just how diverse their usage of rocks were. They're using a wide variety of rocks. They had access to a wide variety of rocks, way more than hominids typically did. That just has to do with the geologic setting. I was lucky that that was the case. And because they've got access to a wide variety of rocks, you can see which ones they're choosing to use more frequently. And then you can actually tie that to the material, see if there's a relationship between what they like to use, what they seem to use a lot, and things seem to flake carefully, and the, the physical properties of those specific raw materials. So you can do things like a, a Tabor abrasion test. You can look at the, abra the, the hardness of rocks. And you can compare the hardness of rocks that, that are on the peninsula that were available to the hominins. And look at that as a variable in, in assessing what they're using and why they may be using particular raw materials. And one of the things, so you want to get quantitative ways of assessing the physical properties of the different rocks, essentially. And one of the things that was really cool about this is that the rock from the peninsula, where the hominids are forming this site, this rock is almost all soft, relatively soft. And in fact, much of it doesn't flake well either. So it's not what you'd consider very good quality raw material for, for stone tool manufacture. And the rocks that are coming from the, the highlands up here include cherts and quartzites and quartz. They are much harder rocks. And they're easier to flake. And they hold an edge much, much longer because they're much harder. So this was a great natural experiment that if I could have set it up this way, I would have. And it just so happened that it, this was the natural configuration of resources. I was very, very lucky. So you've got crappy rock where the hominids are and, and really good rock in terms of holding an edge and, and being easy to flake from farther away. So this is a nice sort of situation to see what, how hominids were transporting rock across the landscape. And if you look at, you know, do look at the technology, the local sources of stone, these soft rocks that often don't flake very well, are, not, are frequently not very heavily flaked. Right? And they're also not very carefully flaked. And if you look at the rocks that are coming from 10 or more kilometers away, these rocks are much more extensively flaked. They're also taking much more care in the way they're flaking them. They're using multiple. Um, multiple axes for the flaking. They're flaking <coughs> things much more fully. And, and they're taking more care in flaking them so that even the flakes, so, you can, so that they're extracting more perimeter per mass, more perimeter per unit rock of the exotic raw materials, the more distant raw materials versus the local raw materials. So they're getting more cutting edge per, per kilogram of rock of the exotic raw materials. And then those flakes actually hold an edge a much longer period of time. So we've done butchery experiments with them, for example. And the local limestone, will, won't, you can't even remove the skin from one leg of a goat with a limestone flake. Before it's so dulled, you can't even use it anymore. Whereas you can take one quartzite flake, and you can butcher the whole goat. So if you're thinking about the economics of, of transport, having a, the, even though it's coming from farther away, the working edge and the, and the use life of the edge of the harder raw materials is so much longer than, than the local raw material that it, it makes sense if, if lithics are an important part of your foraging adaptation. It makes sense to actually carry the good stuff around rather than just dealing with the local stuff, which is soft and, and doesn't hold an edge for long at all. So, and you can see even very small, you know, hard raw, you know, small cores of the hard raw material. So these are quartz cores. And, you know, this is a couple centimeters long. You can see that they knocked a whole bunch of flakes off of this tiny little core. I mean, and I couldn't even, I wouldn't be able to knock anything off it. So when you're looking at what's going on, it looks like it ends up that a third of the hominids, a third of the artifacts from Kanjara are actually coming from more than 10 or 13 kilometers away, minimum, right? That's a minimum transport distance. So the hominids seem to really appreciate the, the high quality raw materials, and they're actually preferentially moving it around the landscape. And even you know, where they've got rock at their feet, they're still often using the higher quality raw material that they've carried from some distance to, to the, the northern margin of the, the Hama Peninsula. <coughs> so it's a preferential transport of high quality raw materials, which shows that they have an appreciation of the physical properties of the rocks 
and they're acting on their knowledge based on their experience with these different raw materials. All right, so that suggests that, in fact, lithic technology is very important to them, that they're actually investing energy in moving rocks. And if, you, if I told you just to pick up a, a, a kilometer, I mean a kilogram of rock and walk around with it for the day, you would see you would get tired, right? I mean, it's, it's not something that, you, that, that is free. You actually invest energy in walking around with this raw material. They're investing energy and in transporting these, these high-quality raw materials. So it's not, it is something that they're putting energy into. So given the energetic investment in this technological system, what are the stone tools being used for? All right, and we can get at this through two primary ways right now, zooarchaeological analysis and u square analysis. And the zooarchaeological analysis is, is doing the analysis of the fauna from the site. And like I said, most of the fauna are antelope bones, and a lot of them are, are small. You've got to look, you can look at how hominids modified bones, but you've got to consider how carnivores modified bones, too. Because you always have at these sites hominids and carnivores active. And the question is, has been often, you know, are these sites largely carnivore accumulations where the hominids are doing something else? What is the relationship between the artifacts and the bones? Can you prove that the hominids were the ones collecting this assemblage? If the hominids are forming the assemblage, are they scavenging from carnivores that have already pulled off most of the resources from the bones and they're just getting marrow and maybe brains and not much else? Are they getting access to the full kit and caboodle of marrows, brains, muscle, guts, everything? Right? And everything's being raw, eaten raw now, right? So, you know, there's no evidence for fire at this time period. So you've got to look at how carnivores damage bones and how hominids <laughs> damage bones and then assess how the site was being formed. And I've been doing a bunch of experiments with different students on, on large carnivore feeding behavior and how that impacts bones. And we've been doing it with wolf colonies, with, with lions and tigers. So this, is in, this wolf center is in New York, the Carolina Tiger Rescue Center is in North Carolina. We've been working on, you know, with, with large cats and, and big wild canids as well and looking at the damage signatures you get on the bones. Right? We do butchery experiments as well. So it's looking at what carnivores do, looking at what hominids do in the published literature as well. So we do butchery experiments and you, know, you can take limbs and deflesh them. I use this one flake to deflesh all that. You can look at where the cut marks are distributed. That's what that, that arrow is showing. You break bones open for the marrow and see what kind of damage you make for the, dones, the from, on the bones. So all these things allow you to assess what processes, what activities are going on at that site and you know, try to figure out what the hominids are actually doing there. All right, so there is definite hominid activity on the site. You can definitely see the hominids are removing tissue. There are cut marks on the bones. So you can see that box, those fine, thin lines are stone tool cut marks on the bones. From removing flesh from that femur. So femurs have a lot of you know, meat on them. So that's a very fleshy area. You expect there to be cut marks there if they're getting flushed carcasses. There are percussion notches for breaking the bones open with, with large stone tools to get the marrow out. You also get the pits that the stone tools make while the, when the hominids were hammering the bones. But there are also carnivore tooth marks and carnivore tooth pits, right, scores and pits. And here you actually have something of both. You've got a hominid cut mark that showed the hominid was cutting something off the bone, but it's overlaid by a carnivore tooth mark. So it shows the hominid behavior was first and the carnivore behavior followed it. That, that doesn't happen very often, but it's kind of cool when you get that. And, you know, what you hope to do is reconstruct what's going on in the site. And in, this, in the 2009 field season, one of the coolest things I found was an outside clast, so a big cobble with, with bones around it. And that cobble had to have been dropped there by hominids. It's in a silt. <coughs> and, you know, what, I, what, what we saw then were, were bone, you know, bone fragments. And some of these bone fragments have clear evidence of hammer and anvil percussion. So I actually think this is an, a two million year old anvil where the hominids are actually processing bones for marrow. And you can see the damage on the top and bottom of the bone where the hominid was resting his bone on the anvil and, and hitting it from above. All right, so there's clearly evidence of, and you also have some percussion, some shatter when the bone exploded when the hominids hit it. You've got some of the shatter and the sieving as well. So it's clear you've got hominid activity at the site. It's clear you've got carnivore activity at the site. Are the hominids having early access to fleshed carcasses, which is more interesting socio-ecologically in terms of whether they have a lot to share out in a group? Or is it just bits and pieces that maybe one individual was snacking on? 
There are different ways of getting at that. If carnivores are forming an assemblage first, this is from work that Rob Blumenshine and colleagues did, you see a lot of tooth marks on the shaft because they're removing the flesh from the shaft, and then they chew up the ends of the bones because they're nice and greasy. If, if hominids have broken, stripped the meat off, have broken the bones from marrow, and then carnivores have come in and scavenged them, you actually don't get that many tooth marks on the shaft because the hominids have already re removed the, the, the nice stuff that the carnivores would eat. But the carnivores are still chewing up the ends of the bones because they're nice and greasy. So really, the mid shafts are a really good region of long bones to look at to get a sense of whether carnivores are first or hominids are first in, in, in processing materials. And these are just different experimental models that have been produced. This is the, the frequency of mid shaft uh, tooth marks. And when carnivores are first, as I said, they tend, especially things like hyenas, they tend to produce a lot of mid shaft cut mar uh, tooth marks. If you've got in simulated sites where people have broken bones open, stripped meat off, broken bones open from marrow, laid them out in settings in the Serengeti and in Gorongoro Crater, and then just let wild animals come in and modify the site, you get very few tooth marks on these mid shafts because the, the, the hominids have already removed, the humans have already removed the, the meat and marrow. And these are the values from Kanjara. We had three different people do it, including Joe Ferraro, who was, you know, this is part of his dissertation. Three different people do it to look at inner observer variability. And we got essentially the same results with each person who independently looked at these bones. Very, very few carnivore tooth marks on the mid shafts, which suggests that the hominids are getting early access to these carcasses. <coughs> and you can also look at this using GIS image analysis. This is a more sophisticated way of doing it. I just had a student finish her dissertation looking at this and looking at bone preservation patterns and spatial distribution of bone modifications. Jennifer Parkinson's the one who did this analysis. And you can map every bone fragment that you can side, that you can attribute to a particular bone and side, you actually put onto this three-dimensional template. And you know, over time, you can stack all of the humori, say, from the assemblage and have one composite image that gives you a density diagram of the preservation of the humerus across that assemblage. So this is, these are 48 wolf gnawed humeri, and you can get a lot of information from what you see here, from this gradient map. So you can see that wolves almost always are chewing off the proximal end of the humerus, right? That's why it's gray. There are only, only three, of the, three of the 48 humeri preserve that. And you can see that the portion of the humerus that's most commonly preserved is, is low in the shaft towards the distal end. All right, so this is really useful information for trying to assess how carnivores that are eating whole carcasses, whole deer carcasses, are, are, are modifying the bones. And you can compare that to when bones are percussed with hammer stones, or when their bones are percussed with hammer stones and then laid out and carnivores follow them and remove the epiphyses. This is the Kanjara data, and you can see that the Kanjara data are all fragmented, which is what you see in a hammer, a hammer stone modified assemblage. They're not cylinders like you see frequently when you've got canids or felids. It doesn't really matter. You know, they, they chew off the epiphyses, but they're often not cracking the, the, the mid shafts. If hyenas were doing this, they'd just eat the whole bone. So there's not a hyena model. Because when you model it with hyenas, they just eat everything, all right? <laughs> they, they have adaptations for bone crunching. So we're talking about non-bone crunching carnivores. And um, you can see that. You know, at Ken Jarrett, the bone, the bone shafts are all broken up from marrow processing. And, you know, the epiphyses are also in low frequencies, not as low as these experiments that were done by, by groups from Rutgers. And that's because they were doing these experiments in very competitive environments in the Serengeti, Serengeti and Ngorongoro crater, where pretty much everything was vacuumed up if it had any nutritional value. And the hyenas and, and other critters were just going into these sites and just eating all the epiphyses. That's why none of the epiphyses are there. So what I think we've got going on here is that the hominids are, are breaking the bones open for marrow, but you've got less carnivore picking, less carnivore consuming of, consumption of epiphyses afterwards just because the carnivores aren't as stressed. It's not as competitive an environment. And there are, I mean, and that's, you know, there are other lines of evidence for that too, like just low evidence of carnivore damage in general on these bones. Here's the femur, another big meat-bearing, marrow-bearing bearing bone as well. And again, it's the same feature. You can see that this, this portion of the femur is the most commonly preserved. And, and where you've got a lot of the bone representatives are the, are the shafts. So the shafts are being smashed open, and the epiphyses are being removed to, to varying degrees. 
Now, if you look at meat distribution, you also want to get at meat distribution. So it looks like they're definitely doing a lot of marrow processing. We've got some indication that hominids are there first. What else can you look at? You can look at cut mark distribution with this GIS method. And if you're looking, people typically think if hominids are scavenging, they're scavenging from felids. So felids will strip the meat off of bones, but leave the marrow bones and the brains behind. So it's sort of the zombie mode of like eating brains and all that stuff. So, so the hominids would be then getting access to bones that were largely defleshed if they were passively scavenging. Um, and felids typically consume flesh from the upper limb, but not the lower. And they often leave scraps of flesh at the joints. All right? So here's the hip joint, and here's the knee joint of, of a deer. All right? So these are from some of the feeding experiments that Jennifer Parkinson did for her dissertation. And you can look at the zones on a bone where you know, even from scavenging, there'd be some scraps of flesh left over. And you can look at where the cut marks are distributed across the tibia. These dots represent percussion marks. So you can see where the cut marks are. And cut marks, at Kenjar, are frequently found in areas where you generally don't have flesh remaining in scraps, where you don't have little bits of flesh that hominids would have very carefully taken away if they were passively scavenging. The cut marks are, are occurring in places where, where you know, there probably was flesh in the bones and they're stripping the flesh off. So this is another indication. You know, we all have other indications that hominids are coming first based on that earlier analysis. But this also shows that the hominids are cutting, leaving cut marks in places that would have been defleshed if they had been scavenging from lions. All right? So they're, they're getting access to meaty carcasses. And you can also, another way of getting it, whether they're getting access to complete carcasses, is looking at bone survivorship and looking at what are called high, high survivorship bones, parts of the skeleton. Right? The vertebra and ribs are lousy to look at if you're trying to reconstruct whether whole, whole carcasses are going back because they can be broken up by a whole variety of processes. Often they just break up on the surface before they're even buried. But you know the jaws, so, so the upper and lower jaws, the shafts of the major limb bones are preserved. And if you look at the frequency of head bits as well as major limb bits, you can get an idea of whether whole carcasses are being brought to the site from these high survivorship portions of these bones are not. And you can actually do statistics on this, right? So there's something called the Shannon Evenness Index, which gives you a sense of whether you've got an even distribution across these high survivorship bones that are found across the skeleton or not. And for the small animals of Kanjara, you actually have a very high value, which shows that things are coming together as a, as a group in, in the proportions you would expect if they're bringing whole carcasses to the site. So, you know, the most common bone is the humerus, and then you've got all these other limb bones. But the mandible and cranium, you know, all these things are really very common, and they're coming in approximately in the proportions you'd expect if whole carcasses are being brought to the site. All right, and many of these carcasses are from juveniles. All right, 50% of the, of the animals are juvenile animals. And this is in an open environment that you've got here. This is a good lunchtime picture. This is not, this is not what you'd expect an assemblage to look like if hominids are scavenging because large carnivores tend to completely consume these, these small animals, especially in the more open habitats. So all of these, are, I, I think, are lines of evidence that you've got hominids getting early access to antelopes repeatedly, you know, over tens or even tens of years or, or centuries. So you've got the best evidence for hominids eating, incorporating meat into the diet for long periods of time. Than, that, that you have anywhere in, in the archaeological record. And this was published in PLOS One last year. This was a, a Fraro et al. 2013. Um, so it's evidence of persistent carnivory. The medium size, I'm going to go through this a little faster now because I see I'm running out of time. The medium sized animals are, in fact, showing a different signal. They, they, there are a lot of limb bones that do show damage, showing the hominids are processing them, but they're way more heads than you would expect. Um, so there's a, a disjunction, and you can see the evenness index is, is lower here with these guys because there are more heads than you would expect for the limb bones that you've got, which suggests something different is going on. And when you look at, this is something I, you, know, you notice when you're excavating. It's kind of cool. This is a, an antelope jaw. You can see the, the big upright portion with this very delicate process called the coronoid process. And you see that the toothy portion, the mandibular corpus, when you're looking at the Kanjara mandibles, they're often missing the upright portion, right? They don't preserve them. And you might think that carnivores are chewing them off, 
except you find them in the excavation broken off, even with the delicate part still preserved. And this is not what you would see if, if carnivores had come in and chewed these up. So these aren't being broken open by carnivores. And in fact, on, on a couple of mandibles, we found percussion damage. The hominids are, for some reason, I guess, breaking the bones open. And they're breaking the mandibles open, and it looks like they're breaking the brain cases open for uh, brain as well. So it shows that, and this is what you'd expect if they're more stressed for nutrients, right? Or they're getting late access to carcasses, right? So they're picking up the heads occasionally. So you seem to have a more mixed strategy going on with the medium-sized mammals than you do with the smaller mammals, which is cool. I mean, people have argued about hunting versus scavenging forever, but I actually think you've got evidence for both going on here, where you've got complete, you know, access to pretty complete smaller-sized bovids, maybe through hunting, and a mixed acquisition strategy of medium-sized carcasses, including the selective transport of heads, which may be seasonal. One of the things we want to get at is seasonality and, and you know, that there are a lot of issues related to seasonality and diet that we can talk about later. All right, so you've got a different signals, I think, going on. And then when you look at other, the, two, you know, the other site you can compare it to, FLK Zinge, you seem to have hunting of small prey there as well. But they're having earlier, more consistent earlier access to the larger prey at Zinge. And also, there's more competition at Zinge. There's more intense processing of the carcasses, and there's more evidence of both hominid and carnivore activity. So I think we've got some ecosystem level differences between these two sites where you've got a more competitive setting at, at Zinge, which is you know, in the Ser Serengeti today, and it may have been more competitive in the past in that area, than, than you had in the, in the ancient Kanjara ecosystem. You can also look at stone artifact function when you're trying to get at what these stone tools were used for based on use wear analysis. And here you're actually looking at the edge damage you get on an artifact of particular raw material when it's used to process different sorts of things. So you have to do a whole bunch of experiments with this. So for, we did, we, we're, we're, we've got a paper that's in revision in J, for JHE on this use wear analysis. And it's the use wear analysis of the quartz and quartzite artifacts. And you know, we did experiments to provide controls for Christina Lamarini at the University of Rome who's doing this analysis. We, we, were, we did wood, we did grasses and reeds, we did a bunch of butchery experiments, bone scraping and also wild tuber peeling and sectioning, because people have talked about tubers as being significant in hominid diet for many, many years, but there's no real evidence for it beyond about 300,000 years ago. And we actually ship with, with you know, Frank Marlowe's broader project with Alyssa Crittens. We, 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 she, she took flakes of our raw materials out with her, and, and when she, she you know, gave them to, to Hod's women who were collecting tubers, and they actually cut the tubers out of the ground, wild tubers out of the ground, then actually cleaned the tubers with our flakes. So we had that as use wear templates for trying to interpret the Kanjara artifacts. And we did a blind test in Christina to see whether she was really seeing, interpreting the use wear properly. And she did well in the blind test. So then we moved on to the actual use wear analysis. And in terms of subsistence activities, there is, you know, she, she found use wear that was related to butchery, which we already had based on the zoo archaeology. But what was really interesting is it seems to be use wear related to USO processing. The hominids are processing foods that are reasonably <coughs> soft but are covered with grit, which we're interpreting as some sort of USO. So underground storage organ. And it also looks like they're doing something with wood. So they're cutting, two million years ago, they're cutting and scraping wood, which suggests they're probably making tools, wooden tools. And if they're hunting and digging up tubers, you know, simple pointed sticks would be useful for digging up tubers as well as for hunting, right? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily surprised, but it seems like they're, they're woodworking. There's also one artifact that seemed to be used for bone scraping and then cutting of silicious plants, you know, grasses or reeds seem to have been done as well. And if you look at this, you know, about a third of the, the small sample of artifacts that we got use wear on about a third of them are related to animal processing, and, and two-thirds of the ones that we can actually get some sort of material idea of what material is being processed, two-thirds of them are being used to process plant materials. All right, so when you find the site and you're looking at the bones and you're looking at the stones, you're thinking butchery, butchery, butchery. But what the use wear is suggesting is, in fact, there's a lot going on that's not related to butchery. There's a lot of activities related to plant utilization that's completely invisible from standard archaeological methods going on at these sites. All right, so when you think about this research and what we're able to tell from this in terms of the habitats 
the energetic investment in lithics and what artifacts were used for. By two million years ago, on the Hama Peninsula, all the Mohammedans are utilizing open habitats. And you know, this compared with other old one sites shows that old one hominids are forming sites in a broad array of habitats. There is energetic investment in this technological system. They're probably making tools with tools. So they're probably using stone tools to make wooden tools. And they're also utilizing these tools to acquire foods that are high quality but difficult to acquire, like animals, right, which run away or which fight you when you try to kill them. And, and, and tubers, which you've got to dig up, right? And some, some, depending on the species, some of them are very hard to acquire. All right, but these are also coming in packets that are large enough that can be shared. So what this really looks like is, by two million years ago with the old one at least, is I think we've shifted to a, a strategy of tool-dependent foraging. They're not, they're not casually using tools. They're, 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 they're at a, they're, they're, they are dependent on these tools. They're using these tools all the time across the landscape. That's why they're transporting rock around, because they have to have the tool with them when they find particular resources that they want to process. And it's not tool-assisted foraging, which, where they would just incidentally use tools or occasionally use tools. And I'm now shifting to a packet of old Awan sites that will include Kanjera, but also a site called Nyayanga, which has got large mammal carcasses, including hippos and rhinos. And I found a hippo bone on the surface that had a cup mark on it and some percussed bones there. And that's in a woodland. So it's different from Kanjara, both in terms of the environmental setting and the sorts of animals you're getting. And then there's a site over here called the Sari River site, which I've walked out for three kilometers. And, and it's a paleo landscape site, which is totally cool. It looks like it's one, it looks like you can follow one paleosol over a very long distance. And you know, I haven't found bones yet at that site, but there are older one artifacts distributed across this landscape. And geologists have mapped the tough paleosol sequence over a 30 square kilometer area. So I haven't checked these, are, these gullies yet, but if I'm lucky, this could be a giant, like a giant early Stone Age landscape. And in terms of the isotopic chemistry, we already have evidence just in the two spots we checked in the Sari River of, of, of the most wooded environment that we found yet on the Hama Peninsula, as well as a, a more grassy environment. Yayanga, like I said, this site here, is more wooded, and Kanjara is grassy. So in combination as a packet, we're going to be able to look at a wide variety of habitats that hominids would have had access to in this within one region rather than comparing across regions, as well as looked at very artifact, you know, raw material usage and choice and transport and technology at sites that are close to the raw materials versus sites that are farther away from the raw materials. So there are a whole bunch of variables that we'll now be able to sort of assess in looking at hominid behavior and we'll be able to start putting it onto a broader landscape than we could in the past. So that's the next four years of, of work. And I'd like to thank the National Museums of Kenya, Rick Potts, and the Human Origins Program, who, who really helps make much of my work possible, and the National Science Foundation and the Leakey Foundation for funding. So thank you very much. Just one more. Uh-huh. I'm really intrigued by the, the useware analysis and the tools making tools angle on it. Um, uh, is is bone and are bone and antler sufficiently similar that you couldn't distinguish working one from cutting on the other? Compared to wood? Yeah. Or, to wood. Uh, bone looks different than wood. Yeah. yeah. So uh, antler is. is well, I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about antler here because nothing has antlers. Uh, right, cause in, in, the, the, there are no deer here. They're just antelopes. So antelope horn cores are just car keratin sheaths over okay. a bone, over okay. bone. Okay. So, so, so it's a different sort of structure in antelope. Okay, so my second question, the same logic as the first, is um, is there the potential to do the same kind of analysis with regard to the lithic raw materials with botanical raw materials. So are there, you know, something like the equivalent of manzanita, right? So a really, really hard wood, which is going to shape the, the stone tool used in a different way than a softer wood. Potentially. I mean, that's why you need to, you need to, to, to work different woods of different hardnesses. Yeah, and, and we're also going to look at in this next time out, we're going to looking for plant phytolists. So we're going to look for phytolists on the edges of the artifacts to see which can be identified if, if there's some big data banks on phytolists for East African plants. 
And I even have a guy coming out who's going to look at starch for starch granules, which I think are to it's a total long shot. I, I really doubt starch is going to be preserved for two million years. But he's going to bring, you know, a clean lab to the field, essentially, where you've got this inflatable thing that you put over the excavation. And he's going to excavate it himself in a spacesuit. And, and if, if he gets starch granules on the edges of the flakes, that will have come from ancient times. He will not have introduced them. So, yeah, I think the use where there is an error rate with all of these analyses. Use where is interpretive. I'm also trying to develop a quantitative analysis. There, there are people who are trying to do quantitative analysis looking at the, the microscopic topography of stone and relating topographic changes, changes in, uh, in roughness to working different raw materials. And that would actually be a way of doing it quantitatively. Um, right now I'm relying on expertise, an ex expert opinion looking at a microscope. But, and she did well in the blind test. She had about a 70% success rate, which for these kind of analyses is very, very good. Um, so I'm pretty confident that we probably have like major classes identified correctly. I wouldn't know about the proportions. There, with the error rate maybe high enough that you, you can't say too much about the proportions. Other than I think it's pretty interesting that so much of it was attributed to plants versus meat. But yeah, you've got to do the experiments with as wide array of things as you can from the environment. And we're going to keep doing these experiments as we go out. She's coming out with students, and we're just going to be doing lots of useful experiments. Yeah, so that, I mean, just to, to make the logic that I was <coughs> suggesting clear, uh -huh. if it's the case that there, that there are enough um, differences in the ecological circumstances across the landscape, mm -hmm. different trees are going to grow in different places. Right. And that some are more desirable as a source of wood for tools than right, others. Right, right. Then conceivably you could, be, I mean, you can envision a day when it's possible to talk about the transport of wood materials the way that it's currently possible. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. And, and, and that would be useful to look at with the use where, and, and you know, I, I hope that Phytolis turns something up as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, this is an incredibly fascinating material. Um, I was wondering if there's any way to talk about the kind of a more individuated model of how these societies actually work. Because what you do is you basically says the home, you know, you say the home. Right. Happens, right. Yeah. And then you say, well, there's, a, there's maybe some gathering, there's some hunting, that's a suggestion that there might be a division of labor. How are these skills transferred? Right. Um, is there evidence of consistent use of stone tools? In other words, is there like a culture that's formed where you're being trained in some way? Uh, anything that you could say on those? Th that's that's the debate for the older one. Whether whether you actually have to have, how much of it could be trial and error versus active instruction, or or at least very careful observation. Right now, for the Acheulean, I would say a lot of archaeology for, for a little bit later in time, like. 1.8 million and more recently to about 300,000, where they're making hand axes. Many, many people think that there's probably instruction going on and, and very careful observation. Um, I, I would think for the old one too, though, it, I don't know if there's active teaching, but, but I, I'm sure that there's very careful observation going on because some individuals, yeah, that's, that's about all you can say, I think. I don't want to say more than that. There, there, there are definitely some sets of, of artifacts that show a, huge, a, a really high degree of skill in reduction going back to 2.3 million years ago. Yeah. I mean, and and yeah. so, so I don't know. I mean, partly it may be because these things are so important for their survival. But, you know, it does show that there, there are individuals who are highly skilled and, and are clearly, you know, they can do it better than I can at this point, you know, some of them, at, in terms of producing these flakes. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was observation going on and whether you'd say it's actual active instruct, you know. Right. No, I mean, I didn't even necessarily mean mm -hmm. that there had to be explicit uh, mm -hmm. act to instruct, right? Right. But, uh, you know, am I learning sophisticated ways of doing things by skillful people in my tribe? Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I, I would not be surprised given the, the technological stage you're at at least by two million years ago. I wouldn't be surprised if that was going on. <clears throat> Gail? Mm -hmm. One of the really interesting things about the really early sites of an Ethiopia, Gona, and mm -hmm. Gori, is the almost near absence of very small animals. Yeah. Uh, and it's not preservation because they've got eggs, ostrich eggs. They do have small material. They don't have small organisms, small animals. Mm -hmm. 
how many small animals? My guess is they're not bringing them back. Mm -hmm. um, but how many size one uh, are uh, the really small animals? Right. Are you getting? Well, I, I, you know, size one and size two, so things that are goat sized and smaller. Um, at the site, there are, I, I think, a minimum number of about 34, 35 individuals from, that have been come out of the excavation so far. Really small ones? Well, I mean, they're, they're goat sized and smaller. And some of them are babies. So there's some, you can look at dental eruption. So I didn't talk about the mortality data. But, but some, of the individuals are, are, some of the individuals are probably three months old or younger. So, so those would be obviously easier to catch than the bigger ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you find um, lithic depotage like in proportion to the amount of tools you find at these sites, or does it seem like production's going on? There's not. There, there are fewer cores than you would expect for the number of flakes. So it's a flake-dominated assemblage, and I think they're walking off with cores. So, so they're they're knocking flakes off, and then they're walking away with the cores. So, and you know, and they may be walking away with the flake. You don't, you don't actually find, even when you've got the same raw material, you can't, you can't do really extensive refit sets. So I, I think a lot of the material actually leaves the site, especially the higher quality raw material. I, I think they're actually, some of the nicer flakes they pick up and, wa and walk away with, and, and the cores they're walking away with too. So we have far fewer cores than you would expect for the number of flakes at the site. Yeah, Dwight? Yeah. It's a very interesting argument in terms of being able to show that you've got tool dependency, tool dependent foraging mm -hmm. at this particular site, and it's nice that you have such a you know, rich ensemble of materials to be able to work from. If one were taking this site and say as an indication of what a, or a tool dependent foraging assemblage might look like, uh -huh. what would happen if you were to then say compare this to earlier hominid sites with respect to trying to say? Where does tool dependency begin to come in? Because obviously if it's here, it had to begin earlier than that. Right. How much earlier? Can you get a handle on looking at earlier sites and say, in comparison, it looks like this is not a tool dependency uh, foraging site? Well, or is it, uh, it, at, at most old one sites, even some of the oldest sites, there, there does seem to be evidence of preference. Now, they may not have to, tr you know, of, of the, they, they, they do prefer certain raw materials over others. And those are often raw materials that have some material quality that, that would be attractive to the hominins. So like at Gona, there are more chert, there are more chert flakes than you'd expect from going to the conglomerates, which are right. In, in that case, transport is very short. The conglomerates are very close to these 2.6 million year old sites. They're almost right on top of the conglomerates. But chert is very, very uncommon in those conglomerates. And, and you find it in, high, in higher frequency in, in the artifact assemblage than than in the conglomerates, which shows that they've been, they, they've been cherry picking things from the conglomerates and maybe transporting them around as well, even, even at 2.6 million. I, I think probably, you know, it, it could be that some degree of transport is going on at, at the very earliest sites. Now, the very early sites don't have really dense accumulations, not as dense as, at least they haven't been excavated. A, a really dense accumulation hasn't been excavated. I don't know if they don't exist or whether the people who are working at those sites just haven't dug a big enough hole and gotten enough stuff. But it seems generally that the sites maybe aren't as, as dense and, and, and it's a little bit more diffuse. And, and it may be behaviorally there are some differences at the earliest sites versus what you're getting around two million years ago. Um, there needs, but, but in terms of selectivity from the very beginning, there is an appreciation of, of different material properties of, of, of the rock and, and they're responding to that in their behavior. Uh -huh. What about human remains? I haven't found any hominid remains. No, no they just haven't died there. It seems like a really nice spot, right? They're, 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 they're eating their carcasses raw and they're maybe having sort of raw meat and potatoes and, you know. They're, they're early Irishmen or something, I don't know. But, but they're, they're, uh, they're, not, they're, not, they're not dying there, at least they haven't. We have thousands of bones, we haven't found a human fossil. I'm, you know, you keep working though. There are sites like Alorgosile where Rick Potts worked, where, where they've been excavating there since the 1940s. And they just finally <laughs> found a hominid a few years ago. And there are tens of thousands of fossils from that site. So it may be, you know, the hominids where they're active down, down here is, 
you know, may not be where they're dying. They may be dying up in the more refuge areas where it's more wooded and where they'd be sleeping. And, and that may just be where the sick, the sick guys hang out there and just die. I, I need somebody nailed by a carnivore, by a felid, so they're not all chewed up too badly. And then, and then quickly buried. That's what I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's drawing them to your side? Is that proximity of raw material? <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. There are, there, 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 you know, you do get lenses of conglomerates through the sequence of the local crappy raw material. So there's that there. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And, and part of the problem is you can't put this into a broader landscape to see within a 10 kilometer area what, what's sort of special about this spot versus we don't have 10 kilometers that we can look at at this site. So something is definitely attracting them. Um, it's a well drained, periodically, you know, well drained, it's periodically got water running across it. You'd think this would be a good area for tubers. I, I, I don't know if it could really be related to that. I don't really know. I don't really know. It's an area perhaps where you've got these little antelopes when they have their synchronized breeding, right, synchronized birthing, which little antelopes do. It may be a grassy area where, where it's near where the antelopes are having their birthing and they're just going out and nailing the antelopes and bringing them back to this spot. Could, it could be something like that, but we can't, we can't really tell at this time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so Tom, do you have any... Uh do you have any inklings that you might be able to detect hominin tooth marks on some of the smaller bones of the younger individuals or hominin? Not people, people have been talking about that, and we're, we're going to look at that. And I know you have evidence of that from, your, your, from Domas Tepe. Yeah. So uh, it'll be interesting to see, see the patterning of that. Yeah. You know. And people have published some. Um, it's a bit of a distinctive pattern. Yeah, so yeah. I know in the ends of ribs and little bones, you, you get a lot of punctures and yeah, we, we haven't seen too much of that. In fact, tooth marks just aren't that common in general. But some of the tooth marking could be from hominids. Yeah, it's true. And I would think some of the gnawing on the, on the uh, epiphyses of the smaller, you know, younger individuals, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good snack. Yeah, it is a good snack. It's true. I'm going to do it right after this talk. <laughs> whatever, whatever bones are out there. Uh-huh. Um, antelopes seem um, hard animals to hunt. Yeah. Um, so, so when you're seeing a lot of juveniles, that makes sense. It makes sense, yeah. Um, any reconstruction of what types of skills it would really take to reliably bring down you know, antelopes? Well, if you're Dan Lieberman, you'd just be running them down, right? <laughs> so... So you'd be, you know, you'd be, you'd be endurant, you'd be persistence hunting, and you'd be running them, and, and the little guys, presumably, and the old guys would be easier to, to, to run down. And then all you have to do is have a sharpened stick you can ram into their rib cage, right? Or hit them over the head with a rock or whatever. It, it, it wouldn't have to be technologically that sophisticated. Have you tested them? What? Have you tested them? I, I haven't yet. I'm, I'm not in the shape to do it. Dan, Dan's in much better shape than me, so I, I have to bring Dan out, and I'll have him chase an antelope. But that's one idea. At Olduvai, though, they've, where they have early access both to small things, but they, they, they're arguing that even the, the wildebeest-sized animals are being hunted. They're, that's in a woodland, and it's a more wooded setting. And they think that the hominids are actually, as the animals are coming through the woodlands to go drink in the water, they think the hominids are actually ambushing them in the woodlands, maybe even climb, you know, dropping down from trees to, to, to spear them. So, so they think that they're... You know, the, the current project that's out there with Manuel Dominguez, Rodrigo, and Henry Bunn, they're making the argument that they're hunting there, and it's not persistent running, it's ambushing. That they're ambushing like a lion or a leopard would be, but the way that a primate with a spear would do it. Mm -hmm. Is the, the scarcity of hominin fossils compared to the other fauna, is, it, is, one, is it possible that they were just the, the density or the biomass of the hominins was, was tiny compared yeah, to Yeah, it is. I'm sure the, I'm sure the biomass was small. And even in sites where you've got, I mean, most sites where you've got a lot of hominins, when you look at all the other bones that they've got, you know, places like Kubifora, they're, they're, a, they're you know, the hominids are making up just a few percent of the overall biomass, you know, one or two percent. They're, they're, they're a tiny bit of the, the biomass. They're like carnivores. They're, you, you find them like you find carnivores. Some primates are pretty common, like the giant gelata baboons are, are more common. And we actually have a big assemblage of them 
at, 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 at north of, of Ken, you know, in the, in the northern exposures of Kanjara, which are a little bit younger. That's about 1.5 million. That's actually the type site for Therapithecus oswaldi. And there's a very beautiful collection of, of Therapithecus <coughs> oswaldi there. We have primates all around the peninsula, but, but just not that many from this site. Ecosystem reconstruction resolution fine enough that you can guess as to what kind of tubers would be growing there and what kind of either technology or digestive system it would take to be able to use them? I, I think, I think the, the best way of getting at that is going to be through the phytoliths or the starch grains. I mean, it could be, if you're, if you're thinking it's C4, people have been making the argument that, that corms from sedges are the most nutritious underground storage organs that you'd get in a, in a C4 environment, and they're not very big. They do have a, 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 a you know, grit-covered tunic, though, which I don't know if you just, sli you know, one slice down the tunic and then you peel it off. I don't know whether a stone tool, I actually have been tr corresponding with people who work in the late Stone Age, where they're actually processing quorums a lot in the late Stone Age in South Africa, to get a sense of what they think they're doing to process those, whether they're using stone tools for that. So that's a possibility, sort of sedges, quorums from sedges, the Hadza underground storage organs vary in difficulty to acquire. They tend to be found in, in slightly more wooded contexts. But, you know, I, 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 it doesn't mean that they're not transporting, you know, they're not walking around with some tubers just like they're walking around with, with that. And in fact, the, the artifacts that have tuber use where I don't know if they were actually processing the tubers in that spot or if they carried the flake and, and they processed it back, back on the hill where they were you know, where the trees are, where they're sleeping, and then, and the, but they're just walking around with that flake because it's a nice big flake that's got a sharp edge. So I can't say that all the tuber processing is happening at that spot, just like I can't say all the butchery is happening at that spot. But at least with the butchery, you've got <coughs> bones of animals there. So you know some butchery is going on at that spot. Yeah, I mean, for me, the really intriguing question here is, is whether it, it, one can envision a time in the future when it would be possible to identify the, the, the probable targets uh, the types of tubers with sufficient precision to say whether fire would have likely been involved. Yeah, well, I, I think if we can get phytolith data or starch grain data, then, then we'll, we'll be able to start looking at that. Because fire helps the hods in different ways. And some, some tubers, um, the fire doesn't really seem to affect digestibility that much, but it really improves the ease of peeling it. So there's, there's a tuber called, I, I can't, I don't know what it, how to say it with, with, in, in Hadza, but it, it's spelled ek, backslash backslash aqua, aqua tubers. If, if you roast them for a few minutes, you can peel them much more easily. So it helps with the processing. And some tubers, they just eat raw. There's some that are kind of like Jerusalem artichokes that, you, that, that are juicy and you can just eat them raw. Um, Alyssa has been telling me a lot about this, so she's... Alyssa and Frank are my tuber people, and, and Margaret Schoeninger as well. Um, so yeah, ideally that would be good, because there may be tubers that really you get a lot more out of if they're roasted. And, and if there was a way of, of trying to diagnose ephemeral fires in these sediments, that would help a lot too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, diet composition, can you say anything about that? From, you mentioned C4 grasses and so on. From right. Bones, can you tell any more? Mix? Um, well, well for, the, for the animals, most of them are, are, are animals that are eating plants and, you know, bobbids and so, so antelope, zebras, okay, some pigs. No, I, so I, they're I, thing, I, I forgot, you don't have the hominid bones. We don't have the hominid bones, bones yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but unfortunately not. In the area, it looks promising that you might find something. We might. There. I mean, they're clearly there, and they're clearly, there's a lot of activity. So you just need one to have died there. Yeah. If I could go back in a time machine and pop one in the head and then <laughs> bury it and then go back to the future and get it, then I'd be all set. When you look at the ratio of small to large animals in terms of the site, the bones in the site, I mean, how does that compare to what one would find in an area like that in terms of live animals? It actually compares pretty well, and, and, and Ferraro's got, we've, we're, you know, he's got a, a section of his dissertation where he's looking at sort of whether, whether the frequency you've got at the archaeological site is sort of a census, like a paleo census of what you might expect in a, in a grass science ecosystem. And, and it's not a bad fit in terms of, because you, you get more of the smaller things than you do the bigger things. 
And then even, I think even some of the eighth structure is similar too. Um, so it's not, it's not way out of line with some grass dominated ecosystems that you find today. And it looks like, you know, it's taphonomic bias. It, there's, there are all sorts of biases, right? So there could be collection bias by the hominins. There could be taphonomic biases that could be removing um, certain size class individuals that could mess up trying to do that, that sort of comparison with modern ecosystems. But you do get pretty good preservation of even small things at Kanjara. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think the bias against small bones is as great at Kanjara as it is at some of the other sites. So it looks like they may be, <clears throat> they may be taking things, you know, not, not far off from their frequencies and in, in, in those open settings. That, that would suggest there is no sort of specialization yet developed right. with respect to whatever means they're using to get a animal meat. They're just sort of sampling what's out there. It's, it's more of like an, they get access to yeah, more of an en encounter hunting sort of thing. Small ones to take it directly or if it's larger ones and maybe just through... Uh, scavenging for larger kills, but, but no particular specializations going on. Yeah, not as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Are they these kinds of um, tool use specifically looking for the, the um, tools associated with tubers in any of the Homo erectus or the ergaster sites? It's um, speculation that tuber <coughs> use, maybe this is links up to the answer question about fire, but uh, um, that this really increased in time around the time of Homo erectus. And right. Some people linked that to grandmothers and things like that. Right, so right. I'm wondering if this much earlier um, utilization of the tumors, tubers, tubers um, kind of throws that theory. Well, some people like, like Nate Domini at uh, Princeton, he thinks that even the Australopithecines are eating a lot of underground storage organs. So over time, it's a question really of which ones they're getting and, and how they're being processed. And, and you know, he would argue that even Paranthropus, Paranthropus' giant jaws and teeth are actually, an, he would say, they're an adaptation to eating actually corms, like sedge corms. And isotopically, if you look at Paranthropus robustus and even Paranthropus boisei, you, you can see, like in South Africa, the robustus fossils have isotopic signature that are very similar to naked mole rats that are eating underground storage organs. So maybe they're getting a similar isotopic signal from, from similar diets. Um, yeah, I, I think the thing is, is that if you can cook, obviously, there are, there are big advantages to being able to cook some of these tubers in terms of you being able to digest more of the starch and get rid of some of the toxins and things like that. So bigger tubers than, than the smaller ones? Yeah, I think a lot of the corms you can eat with a lot, without, without much processing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you, you, you clearly have a sense of the, the larger terrain that they're in. What are their, uh, in terms of hominin food supply, uh, what might the forest provide for them? Uh, in other words, in your model, it seems there's still right. lots of room for them spending different amounts, you know, parts of the year in this location. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm sure, I, you know, you can walk, they, they could have just turned around and walked up the slopes of the mountain to get into wooded areas where there'd be different fruits that they could eat. Um, you know, gruya fruits, if you know any of the African fruits in savannas, you know, I don't know if they'd be eating acacia pods, but some primates eat those, gruya fruit. Um, if, if they had access to baobabs, baobab fruits are really nutritious. And, um, you know, the Hadza eat a lot of gruya and baobab fruits. So those are some of the, the wild foods that they're collecting as well. Um, so, yeah, I would think that they'd be eating fruits as, too. And, and, you know, where people have gotten isotopic data from hominids in East Africa, you know, homo generally shows a mixed diet of C3 and C4. It's not, it's not exclusively C4 or exclusively C3. And there's one oddball in South Africa called Australopithecus sediba, which seems to have a very C3 rich diet. And then there are other hominids in Chad and, and Paranthropus, which seem to have very C4 rich diets. But, but most of the other ones are pretty mixed. And, and homos like that. All, all the homos that have been sampled have pretty mixed evidence of both woodland foods and, and more open habitat foods.
-hmm. Is there a way to get a pretty precise idea of how long the site was in use? No. Not yet. I, I mean, it would just be based on the sedimentology. If we can get, see, actually, let me, let me rephrase that. I want to get see, at seasonality. I want, I, I want to try to, we're trying to do that. I've got a student who does isotopes. So there are different ways isotopically to try to get at it. It's not easy. But I, you know, initially, when you're thinking about meat eating and whether meat was important, an important component of the diet, the first step, you don't know what, fr what the frequency would be, really, because our resolution just isn't good enough across the year. But if you could tell whether they were eating meat year-round versus just the dry season, that would be really useful. And so I've got, I've got a student who's trying to assess seasonality just to get at whether meat eating is year-round versus a seasonally peaked thing. And then you can also try to do it through cementum analysis, which people have done with, with uh, deer and other, other faunas. It's not been done in Africa so much, but it's, it's, it's possible to do. And um, I have a student who, who might be doing cementum analysis in some of the teeth. That, that's destructive, though, so you need to get permissions to actually saw saw teeth up. And Henry Bunn, I know, is trying, he's got a student who, he, he's in Wisconsin, he's got a student who, who I think is trying to do it through tooth microwire. So looking at, at um, animals that switch between brows and grays at different seasons, seeing if there's a, a microwire signal at the time of death that reflects what they were eating before they died, sort of a last supper thing. And, and then you could tell whether it was drying, dying in the dry season, whether it died in the, in the wet season. I think getting at seasonality is really important, though. So, so it's something that we're all thinking about and trying to get at. Through that, could you get an idea of like how how many seasons? Um, is, is that something you be pursuing? I, I I think that would be hard to do. I think there'd be enough very you know it's it's all rainfall seasonality. So you're just going from dry season to wet season in East Africa. And there may be enough variation in that over time that it might, you might be able to say whether it's dry or whether it's wet. But I'm not sure we'd be able to correlate between individuals. Specific, you know, individuals would have to have overlapping growth and, you know, to get to basically put together some sort of framework for assessing how many seasons have been lived through. I think that would be hard. Yeah, I can't, I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I don't think anybody could do it right now. It's, it'd be great if they could. All right, thanks. Thank